Hello everyone, welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are live at the University of Illinois Extension Annual Conference. We meet on campus every year, all Extension staff come together and we're going live from the conference. So hit us with your gardening questions like you do every week, add those into the comment box and we're gonna have some fun stuff to talk about today. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist here in Illinois, based in central Illinois, close to campus. And I have three great colleagues with me today to answer all your gardening questions. So, Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Kelly Alsip, and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. And my passions within the topic are integrated pest management and insects and butterflies and bees. <laughs> and native plants and I also uh, do a bit of vegetable gardening in the summer so I think that's something that both Ryan and I dabble in. Yeah so I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator here in Champaign and I guess my area of expertise is woody plants, natives, and vegetables are kind of the things that I'm most interested in and we have a special guest with us today. We sure <laughs> do, we sure do. So since we are at conference we were able to bring in some extra folks to our um, to our session today. I'm happy to have Chris with us today. Chris, do you want to tell us what your specialty is? Certainly. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Enroth. I'm also a horticulture educator. I'm based in Macomb, Illinois. And I would say my specialists are everything they've said and also <laughs> um, uh, probably landscape design, landscape architecture, uh, landscaping, basically. That's nice. kind of what I enjoy. Yeah. Nice. And I grow cut flowers. I didn't say that. I don't grow vegetables. Flowers are my, are my ideal. So add those questions to the comment box. We're happy to answer those as we go through today. But what we're going to talk about today actually are landscape fails. So things that we've either done in our own gardens or we've seen people do in their, in their gardens. And maybe talk about some alternatives, the ways not to do those things. So Chris is going to kick us off. Oh, boy. So Chris, what is your favorite landscape fail? Well, I don't know if I'd call it my favorite, but it's definitely a good <laughs> your top. Peeve. Uh, I, I would say the thing that, that bugs me is when, when people have these tiny mulch beds, uh, maybe they put in a single plant or a couple plants right next to each other, and then they just put mulch around it, and then they leave these like awkward strips of grass or lawn in between. and. Hmm. I, I just I would like to see more of a cohesive design that like shapes its uh, the space around that area whether it's a lawn or a patio but I don't know it, it, it's so hard especially if you're doing maintenance there you might be mowing and you got to fit that lawnmower in between those narrow strips let's let's make big planting beds with lots of plants and mm -hmm. that, that's that's the thing that I, I want to see more of yeah um, so less tiny planting beds more bigger ones, more okay. plants. Well, yeah. well, that would make it much easier to mow around. <laughs> oh, so like, like, how this would be like, like a mowing nightmare? Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll, so we have photos of a lot of these fails we're going to talk about today. So you'll, you'll be able to visualize yes. some so of these So I would things. hope like in your photo there, that person's plan was to slowly expand those mulch beds <laughs> and connect them as the root systems expand. But I think you're you right that like a lot of those, so. that is the permanent permanent plan for those spots. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. and it's the, the person mowing or maintaining it that has to deal with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Think about that maintenance part. So you would have made this into a much larger bed and added a lot more plants. Oh yeah, bigger bed, so more, you know, the photo they're showing, there's a lot of structural plants there. Mm -hmm. Let's get some flowering plants. Mm -hmm. Let's get mm -hmm. some, uh, some annuals, pop some in for some color in the spring, the summer, and the fall. So I... Yeah, I just want to see more plants, bigger beds. Uh, so that's that's what my Agreed. biggest kind of pet peeve. And there's actually another thing uh, on that picture you might notice, the amount of mulch that's around mm -hmm. those plants. Mm -hmm. That is another huge pet peeve of mine, a mm -hmm. big landscaping fail. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen mulch volcanoes in your area. Sure or are they have. just everywhere where I am? Sure have. Never, I call oh, them yeah. something different. Uh, I, I learned this from another horticulture educator, uh, more like a bagel and less like a muffin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But yes, mulch yeah. volcano, you know, it's mulch volcanoes are one of the things where I kind of hit my head and I, I, I want to go kick the mulch away from the tree so I can save the tree's life. Yes. And but you'd have to do that a lot. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot, There's a lot of, of mulch. A lot of trees. And I submitted a photo of one where someone did a, a river rock mulch volcano, which I hadn't <laughs> seen before. That was a new type of volcano to me. 
Because normally you're using your hardwood, yeah. hardwood mulch, and you're you're adding it up. So why is this a bad thing for the tree? What's going to happen if well, you do a mulch volcano? With the mulch volcano, it's it, it, the issue is roots are adapted to being in the ground or being covered up. Trunks are not. And so when you put something up against that trunk, it, it doesn't dry out. It stays wet longer, which means you have issues of rot, which is a vector for disease and other insects, rodents, things like that. And the, the tree oftentimes will rot right around that base. And you, you, it, it's, it's just a huge problem. And if you talk to a lot of professional landscapers, they, they know volcano mulching is not the way to go. But it's such a common practice that the homeowners often will call them back after they've come and done a job and say, why didn't you mulch volcano my trees? So mm. then they have to go back because the customer it, is always right. Because they see it so often. Well, because the customer yeah. paid for all that mulch. Exactly. They assume that's, yeah. the way to go. Yeah. that's an interesting point. It just keeps perpetuating that, that uh, interesting thing. whole thing. Huh. Mm. Man. And then somebody decided that they would take mulch volcanoes to the next level and do it with rocks. Yeah, that's a because that is an even, even better more idea. <laughs> more permanent. So, so what would the rock? What would the rock cause any more problems than the mulch? It certainly doesn't add any benefits. I don't think mm -hmm. it. To me, rock mulch is uh, adds nothing horticulturally speaking to either the planting bed or the plants in the bed because it's rock it doesn't it's an really inorganic yeah it won't it's decompose not gonna break down. it doesn't add anything to the soil necessarily if anything it might make the soil or planting bed more inhospitable to the plants because it makes it keeps it warm uh, it might even have some leaching effects of the mm -hmm. ph if you're using mm -hmm. some type of limestone gravel so it, if i could uh, get rid of all of the rock in the landscape world i would do that because and there's another reason too. It's because I've also been a laborer, and I've say, installed. Say, would you come do that, man? <laughs> yeah, that, I've installed lots of rock landscape beds, and that stuff's heavy. Mulch is so much lighter and much easier to install. Well, and in in a volcano setting, that's more weight pressing on the trunk of the tree too. So, yeah, exactly. in a volcano setting, mm -hmm. it's probably yep. even worse for that. And reason. can I say that it's extremely ugly? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's not pretty at all. Certainly. I never thought well, somebody goes, hmm, let me. Put all this rock up around my tree. <laughs> this looks great. Maybe it looks good in the Rocky Mountains looks or the like, Cascades, you know, rock but not in Midwest like. Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so you lose like the benefit with with wood chips. You have that you know decomposition mm -hmm. going on. You know stuff being mm -hmm. added to the soil. You know mimicking that natural uh, forest ecosystem soil environment. So when you add rock, you take all that away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. exactly. Now let's say it's not volcanoed. It's just rock used as a mulch. What any downsides, benefits to that? I, I guess the, the benefits for rock mulch as a mulch is it stays. I mean, it's persistent. Mm -hmm. You don't have too much maintenance, whereas with the wood mulch, it decomposes. It adds organic matter back to the soil, which is good. We want that to happen. And a rock won't do that. But rock also uh, it settles into the soil because of gravity. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put some type of underlayment, beneath that rock to keep it from settling into the soil it's just eventually going to all settle into that mm -hmm. soil and it's going to be a dirt rock pile that you have so a lot of times people will put just plastic underneath rock which is another big no-no we don't put plastic in the landscape it shouldn't be out there in the first place you don't want a restrictive layer that separates you know the above ground environment from exactly the ground ground. Soil. Yeah. i'd say another the issue with rock probably is keeping organic debris out of it because mm -hmm. that you know when leaves and things start to de decompose in there then you actually have soil forming you know weeds can start to take root so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. to me that's a major drawback is that you just you know it's, it's it stays forever but when you start to get that organic stuff mixed in over time then it becomes this just unmanageable mixture so yeah. there's a maintenance mm -hmm. issue to rock that i think a lot of folks don't Think about it they think they'll never have they to they'll leave. Never have just weeds. Do yeah. and yeah. really it it's worse the mm. weeding is worse because i have rock mulch in my backyard when i bought the house and it has the landscape fabric on, underneath and half the yard is rock well basically half the yard is weeds mm -hmm. that i have to sit here and go i need to weed these before they flower because they're growing in my rock mulch mm -hmm. And I've yet to remove the mulch, yes, which is my least favorite part about rock mulch. And anybody who really hates rock mulch 
has dug rocks out of a <laughs> yeah. garden before. Yeah. And it is a complicated process. Yeah. I think we have, a, we have a photo, I think, of one of the beds at, at my house. Because when I moved in as well, previous owners really liked rock mulch. Yeah. And, and it was clear that they were not gardeners. And that's I think that's why they did it. They had a big, long bed between the garage and a sidewalk that had soil in it. So instead of planting something like mm -hmm. we would do... Uh, they wanted something low maintenance, so they put down landscape fabric and just covered it in rocks. And then, of course, when a gardener moves in, you're mm -hmm. like, "Okay, this is not going to work." Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's a lot of work, and that that's what it that's what it was. So now I've seen this rough. bed. Yes, now it since looks much it's a different. beautiful cut flower bed now you have. So what different. process did you have to go through? to remove the rock and remediate the soil. So obviously removing the rock was the first step. So I wish I could say there's an easy way to do that. But for me, it was just digging it out and wheel bearing it to another location. And then what I did, since the soil was so hard and compacted and awful, really, uh, I started with compost, a couple inches of compost on the top, and then just slowly started planting, uh, planting into that. And it's rebounded. I, Great. Things grow great in there now, uh, but it was definitely a process. So there is life after the it, rock. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. Things can come after the rock. So, Chris, <laughs> well, you what, remove it what would you do to remediate rock? Uh, well, it, de it depends. What you got to figure out what are you going to use that site for? So Candace mm -hmm. is going to use it for cut flower production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a lot of homeowners, what I've noticed, especially up against the house, and I got this is a question for you, Kelly. So mm. this is a question show, right? Mm -hmm. I got a question Bring for you. It. Okay. Yeah. So up against the house, is there any benefit for rock if for like insect control, like keeping insects out of the house? If it's just rock, no plants. Is there any benefit there? I, I honestly have no you idea. You know, I really, I really think that, you know, uh, if you truly want insects not to come into your house, you need to find out where they're coming in and stop those places. And w whether it be caulk a window or put a door sweep on, I mean, I'm not thinking that there's all these bad insects growing in the outer part of your rock or even if it's lawn all the way up into your house. Um, you know, some people spray, but uh, I'm not a big fan of thinking that all these insects are going to get into the house just because you have plants yeah, yeah just be, or just because I, I, you have... I think that is a big thing is you know you have plants and all these insects then are going to be attracted to the plants that come in the house but if you have plants and you have insects then you have good insects that yeah. eat the bad insects yeah. and um, I mean, most of the insects want to be on the plants. Like, they don't want to be in your house yeah, most of the time. I mean, we're, we're having a lot of insects come into the house now, which, you know, I thought I'd see brown marmorated stink bug everywhere. Of course, I, you know, think about brown marmorated stink bug a lot more than I actually see it. Mm -hmm. But, um, so it's far. in Macomb. So possibly. far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's there, but. But I think your best point is it just comes back to having a well sealed house. I mean, that, that translates into energy efficiency of your home mm -hmm. and everything else. So, um, Really, that inner, you know, that lower part of your ha home probably does need a lot of attention with caulking and sealing and other things to, to keep stuff out. A lot of homeowners will say, like, that's why I use rock, is because it keeps the bugs away. Like, I don't really know if that's Doesn't true really. or not. I, I yeah. don't think that there's, like, researched papers on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just feel like, you know, to completely eradicate bugs from your landscape is something that nobody will ever be able to do unless they want to release an arsenal of chemicals mm -hmm. on there. Yeah, and we don't so, want to do that. No. Yeah. No, no we, we should just use plants to get the good insects there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, if you're just joining us, we are live from the U of I Extension Annual Conference here in Champaign. We've got our guest Chris with us today, another horticulturist to add to our horticulturist panel, and we've got some questions coming in, so keep those questions coming. Um, Janice is asking, uh, do you have some suggestions for edible centerpieces for Thanksgiving? Mm. Edible centerpieces. What do you think, Kelly? Good question. Well, I mean, I've like dug out cabbage and squash and put <laughs> flowers in there, but I don't think you could eat it afterwards. Yeah, I've certainly done decorative things that had edible components to them, squashes, pumpkins mixed in there, but they weren't necessarily 
uh, you weren't actually eating out of it for uh, for uh, Thanksgiving. I think there's some edible flowers out there. Mm-hmm. You know, roses actually are the most common edible flower, yet they kind of taste like perfume to me. <laughs> um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and orchids are a big edible flower, but you know, there are some edible flowers out there. I don't know if you could find them maybe on the internet. Like yeah, this time of year would be like a, a nasturtium harder. or a calendula that mm-hmm. are beautiful and actually taste pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. yeah. So it was me. I would probably do just a collection of various edible items, mm-hmm. whether it's a, a head of lettuce or a head of kale and some pumpkins. And I know squash that and those like purple that. cabbages are gorgeous. Yeah, and um, you know, yeah, kale. Uh, that that one's still growing in my landscape. Mm-hmm. The snow really didn't slow it down much. I'm <laughs> s- a little surprised. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love art the way artichoke looks in flower arrangements. Oh, yeah, pretty... artichoke does. But look it's not like you're gonna go. Mm, mm, yeah, you're not gonna eat it. Right <laughs> of these. But nice to display. A, yeah, and especially if you can get it local, like an artichoke, you're not gonna get local. But no. many of us have uh, Thanksgiving farmers markets coming up this weekend. A lot of counties do, so you can see what's seasonal and just kind of add that to your table for sure. Great question, Janice. Uh, question from Greg. Our blue spruce are losing their lower branches. Is this normal? I think we have this like tattooed on our arm yeah. by now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Greg, yes, it is normal. Uh, because it's got a disease that's very common in this part of the country. So yeah, more than likely. Uh, it's got some type of uh, a needle blight or a needle cast a disease. It's fungal and it typically starts in the bottom of the tree and works its way up. You can use a hand lens and inspect the needles of that tree. Uh, so you look on the underside, on a healthy spruce, you'll see white uh, little dots. That's the stomata, that's the air exchange uh, opening on the leaf. For trees like this that are diseased, you would likely see black specks or black dots. That means it is clogged with the fungal mm-hmm. organism. Mm-hmm. And it will work its way up the tree. There are uh, fungicides that you can spray to protect it, but very often, more than often than not, I recommend folks to select a different tree and replace that blue spruce. Yeah, and Greg, you can always bring a sample to your local extension office too, and the master gardeners there can look at it under that microscope if you don't have, if you're not able to kind of tell, they can help you out with that too. And two, we also, uh, the University of Illinois Plant Clinic has a uh, fact sheet Mm -hmm. called Spruce Spruce Problems, Problems. am I right? Spruce Spruce Problems. Problems. Mm -hmm that can help you identify one of those diseases. But I also wanted to point out that, you know, when Diana Pleva, who is our plant clinic diagnostician, she calls all these spruce diseases stress diseases, which means that plant was stressed out by you, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> at some point in time, meaning it was either planted incorrectly, planted in the incorrect soil, wasn't watered during drought. And spruces, like Chris said, are notorious for fungal problems. And when people come to me and they want to plant a spruce, I say, don't. Well, I, and along the same lines of stress, I mean, some of the stress on these plants is just our climate. You know, and it goes back to planting something native. Well so adapted. these uh, Colorado blue spruce are not native to Illinois. You yeah. know, they're native to the mountainous regions of the West where you have well-drained soils um, and really dry soils. What do we have in the Midwest? You know, really clay and mm-hmm. poorly drained mm-hmm. soils yeah. sometimes. Mm-hmm. So they, it's, it just, it's just the wrong place for this tree. And I, I don't know why um, we still add this as a landscape plant a lot. I, st- yeah. I see them planted, you know, every day, every year. Um, so... We need to start thinking more along the lines of planting natives and, and plants that are better suited. So I, I know that's not the best answer a lot of folks don't want to hear is just replace your tree. Mm-hmm. But but what um, would some of those examples be? What would you plant I, instead of um, blue spruce? Well, we've ta- we talked about earlier today before we started filming, uh, white pine is kind of mm-hmm. like one of the native evergreens that I really like at, yeah. as far as native. Um, another truly native to central Illinois evergreen is eastern red cedar. Mm-hmm. Now. It doesn't have the uh, ornamental appeal of a Colorado blue spruce, so, uh, but it's a really tough tree. And, and in a lot of places where you have a tough soil environment or a really windy exposed site, uh, eastern red cedar is going to do well. Uh, but again, not going to be as ornament- ornamental and symmetrical of a canopy on that tree. Um, if you are willing to plant a non-native, uh, one of the best uh, kind of copies of a blue spruce that does a little better is con-color fir. 
So it has that really blue uh, foliage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to argue that from an ornamental standpoint, that super blue spruce foliage is just a, a really beautiful uh, yeah. plant foliage to add to the landscape. So if that's what you're going for is just that striking blue evergreen foliage, that's probably the best replacement. Um, Chris, would you have any other yeah. recommendations? I, I was thinking of Concolor fir, Korean fir. Um, there's lots of different cultivars mm -hmm. within that also. Um, and a lot of these new evergreens that we're seeing on the market, they are being selected for that needle color and also for the color of their cones that they develop too. Mm, yeah, so that's fancy. another selection thing. So if you're shopping for a new tree or specifically trying to replace that blue spruce, try to look at some of these new cultivars coming out because they have some neat foliage and some really interesting cone colors. Mm -hmm. All good ornamental features. Very good. Uh, Lauren asks, what are some of our favorite gardening magazines, bloggers, podcasts? Where can she learn more mm -hmm. about gardening? Mm -hmm. Anybody have any favorites? I like this blog. It's called, uh, what is it? Fruits, Frass, and Flowers, or Frass, and Frass, <laughs> and Fruits, something like that. I wonder who writes that. I wonder who writes that. <laughs> it's a pretty good blog, though. It's Flowers, Fruits, and Frass by uh, Kelly. Uh, so. do, do all yeah. of us have a blog? Yeah. I, I, I don't anymore, but a, a lot. Yeah. Okay. So what's your blog, Chris? So I'm Good Growing. I write it also with horticulture educator Ken Johnson. Um, so we get that online, and we also get it in print. Uh, in West Central Illinois, where we're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know our colleague Richard also has a podcast. So if you go to our extension page, uh, you'll be able to find some from us uh, to to start with. Mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, I ha I, I'm, I I have a favorite guy, and I, it, you just put me on the spot because I can't think of its name right now. I know who you're talking about too, and I can't um, think of his name either. Oh, he's from the East Coast. Well, um, it, I, I listen to some podcasts. Okay. So the, the Joe Gardner podcast is one that I really like. He mm -hmm. talks a lot about organic gardening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the world realm of native plants, uh, the um, – oh, uh, gosh, I'm blanking. Is it the uh, Native Plant Podcast? Yeah. Um, In Defense of Plants yeah. is my oh, favorite yeah. Yeah. Really plant yeah, podcast. Yeah. And it, it really gets into – it's it's not always just about plants, the ecosystem, the ecology of different native plants, and really covers them around the globe. And, um, you know, it's produced by a grad student here at U of I. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I like to support that podcast. I think it's really well done. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. There's a few others that I don't listen to as much. Uh, there's a farm to table po podcast that's kind of a good one for organic farming and vegetable production that I've listened to from time to time. But mm -hmm. I do listen to a lot of podcasts, and, and um, interestingly enough, while I garden, I listen to some of these podcasts. But um, yeah, it's, it's a great way <laughs> yeah. to fill time when you're doing other yeah yeah you know, other tasks podcasts. and things so mm -hmm. love podcasts um, i have a favorite website i love going to washington state university and um reading uh, actually the plant clinic diagnostician here turned me on to her mm -hmm. and like uh, uh linda chaucer chalker scott chalker scott, chalker scott. Mm -hmm. she has these the myths about things and i really love how she sets it up and writes it and i like reading her stuff so yeah but yeah, she has a facebook group too called the garden professors which is all research-based scientific information this is also really good. yeah that's a really good one mm -hmm. i like yeah. that one too you've, yeah, you've told she me runs about that, that. Candace. yep yep any other magazines that cool. you get chris um you know i I don't really subscribe to many magazines in print, but I do get the digital edition of, uh, I think it's Horticulture. Uh, I think it's just, that's the name of it. Yeah, I've seen it. I've, yeah. I've read that one. That one is pretty good. Yeah, and yeah. I also do subscribe to a lot of the good, like the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News, um, the Home Yard and Garden Newsletter that comes out this that from Extension here. Um, but then also, I really do enjoy some, uh, he's called the Prairie Ecologist. Uh, his name is, I believe, it's, get this right, Chris Heltzer. He's in Nebraska, and he just is a very good photographer. It's really why I like his stuff. Yeah. And he's also a science-based writer, so mm -hmm. I enjoy his articles quite a bit. Nice. Aaron are, is fiercely trying to type all these links into our, <laughs> into our <laughs> comment box. Awesome. Great questions. Some you, good suggestions there. Uh, not to, uh, I know you got another, but uh, I read the Greenhouse Group. <laughs> And I think it was because the greenhouse grower, sorry, Magazine. greenhouse mm -hmm. grower. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because before I took this job, I was a greenhouse grower. <laughs> and so I love looking at the all the new plants that mm -hmm. are coming out and that's my favorite part about that magazine. Yeah. So there, I always get that magazines. greenhouse grower mm -hmm. um, 
That's a good, I still get that too. Flip, yeah. Flip through it. And then you're like, wow, look at this brand new hibiscus. I need this. And then you write down the name and then you can't find it anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Try to find it. Okay, let's see. We've got a couple other questions here. Uh, Mike's a master gardener asking us a hemp question. So we do have some uh, programs coming up on commercial hemp production from U of I Extension. So you can certainly attend those in, in different areas. But from the master gardener standpoint, we won't be answering those questions from a homeowner standpoint. We're just, um, Extension is just answering those on a commercial standpoint. So hopefully and that'll answer your question, Who is our commercial Mike. guy? Uh, uh, Alber uh, Philip well, Alberti. Yes. So... So he actually yeah, has a page, I think it's go.illinois.edu slash hemp, where he's actually collected a lot of these resources um, put together. So if you're interested on a personal level in learning about commercial hemp production, that's your go-to go -to place. But we won't be answering home gardener questions about um, that group of plants. Uh, Corrine says she has a big question that's too lengthy for today. So where should we, <laughs> where can we send it to? So we'll have Aaron put in the comments where to get us through the the main extension page, Corinne. So we I can say answer since that later. Chris is our guest, we should send you his personal <laughs> email. Yes, yes you and should. he will answer it. Suggestion. Go for it. Very good. Very good. Okay, comment from Angie. And yep, it's just very true. Uh, your master gardener contact us links are not working. Haven't been for a while, and we're working on that, Angie. Don't you worry. Um, any other link to send to become a master gardener? I'm gonna have Aaron put in my email address, and you can contact me directly, and we'll get you to the right place but just know that's getting fixed we're working on that thank you for asking that okay i think we've made it through that list if you got gardening questions put them in the comment box there we're going to get them answered today uh but while we wait uh i think let's go back to landscape fails Sounds what good. else what else do we have ryan do you want to talk about maybe some tree tree fails um sure i mean i think probably like my my biggest fail that i see in trees is planting too deep mm -hmm. you know that's one of the big issues um so uh, we've talked about that a little bit with with yeah. uh, the mulch volcanoes it's, it's the just, same concept yeah yep. yeah that it's just it's not good for the lower trunk an important transition tissue between roots and trunk tissue and so we don't want to cover that up or cause rot there so that that's probably my number one uh, biggest landscape fail that I like to pick on but I'd say probably more often or as often as that I see a lot of pruning issues mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in the landscape mm -hmm. so um, you know that comes back to proper pruning cuts so usually it's a, a stubbed off branch that's left um, it's it's a pruning cut that takes a little too much in one cut where we should have done small more smaller cuts rather than a large cut mm -hmm. um, what are some of the mistakes you guys have seen with pruning or the big Glaring. Well, um, a, a horticulture educator, Richard, Richard Henschel, he shared this really cool photo of a river birch bleeding um, mm -hmm. after some, somebody had cut off a major limb. And so, again, Ryan said that was too big of a limb to cut off, that it really is going to affect the tree. But that uh, a lot it was a uh, improper timing of pruning so a lot of the times we do say prune in the late winter but there are a few exceptions to that rule B birch being one of them maple being another where they bleed really bad not really blood, but you know <laughs> what I mean. Sap. <laughs> <laughs> and so then those are trees that arborists would then um, prune in the fall rather than when it's dormant in the winter time. Or, you know, January. I mean, I think in January you it, probably are still safe. It's just once it starts to warm up and sap starts mm -hmm. to flow, you would get the bleeding like that. I, I think my biggest problem with that, you know, we saw the picture just a minute ago, is just you need to think about the ratio of the size of your cut to the size of the trunk. Yeah, that photo is kind of too bad. the same ratio, you know, yeah. about the same size, then that really is, a, is an excellent opportunity for rot to enter the base of that trunk. So in that case, I think they probably were taking off um, – a large trunk that was maybe over a home or you know some creating some type of hazard well 10 years from now you may have a bigger hazard in that rotten base of the trunk that you could have created from that cut so um, it's may, maybe maybe in some cases the whole tree needs to go as opposed to that just that mm -hmm. one limb uh, or maybe there's a lot of times that we can maybe watch that tree over time it's just you know if you had to make that cut due to a safety issue say there was storm damage mm -hmm. on that large limb you had to make that cut 
that's just a tree that needs to be watched closely by an arborist for rot at the base and, and how that wound is, is sealing over or how the callus tissue is growing over that wound. I would really want to watch closely. So, so Chris, so, we yeah. couldn't go, we can't go into all this tree pruning depth. I mean, maybe we need a whole episode on tree pruning. <laughs> yeah, we do. But, you know, a lot of that photo shows like corrective tree pruning. And really, what do we, what do we learn from people like yourself that we have to prune seven times in the first 10 years or that that should have been corrected from the young tree's life right exactly so you you, you prune young basically mm-hmm. um so that first year you planted typically we say just don't worry about pruning anything off unless it's diseased or damaged or dead then yes prune it that first year once because we kind of want that tree to be established before sure. we start cutting sure. limbs off but then after that first year you should be pruning at least and I think it's seven times in the first 24 or five years of that tree's mm-hmm. life, like substantial pruning to correct mm-hmm. structural issues and, and to guide the growth of that tree for the future. And a lot of times folks do not prune until it's too late. And it's like what we saw with the birch, the, the wound that they wind up having to make is just, it, it is eventually gonna to lead to the death of that tree. You know, bir- birch is a good example, though, of a tree that a lot of times you see as this multi-stem clump. Mm-hmm. You know, and that—that's my favorite version of a river birch. Mm-hmm. But natural growing habit. pruning early on can create a single trunk tree if that's what. You, so I mean, you can really influence the shape of that mature plant with a little pruning at the start. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so it is really important in building that canopy, that structure. Another example is um, Bradford pear, a calorie pear, has really weak branch unions really narrow branch attachments. Um, I have effectively pruned some of those to remove that over time. So if you're pruning regularly enough, there's a possibility you can prune out some of those weak branch unions. And even in the case, an extreme example of a calorie pair, it is possible to get a lot of those weak branch unions out at a young age and not have that immaturity. I wanna add another big pet peeve I have. Oh yes. So this is a warning for for homeowners, people going to go buy a tree. um, nursery growers, they, they're trying to sell you plants. And Certainly. a good, healthy tree is usually just like a whip, but a, you see a strong central leader, not much, too much side branching. Mm-hmm. Most people, they want to see a big, full tree. Yeah, so what they yeah. do is they do a heading back cut in the nursery, which they, that means they clip the top, that central leader, which promotes bushiness, branching. Mm-hmm. branching. And so it's not too bad that first couple years, but as that tree gets to 10 years old, 15 years old, suddenly I call them squid trees. It looks like a squid was planted upside down in the landscape because that branching, <laughs> these limbs get to be super big and they're all at one spot on the on the trunk uh, and you yeah. get structural issues. And so um, just if you're in the nursery and you're looking at this big bushy tree, just pull it back and see if you can see a, fo- a wound where they cut that okay. central leader to kind of promote more branching of that tree. But I mean, really, that that is fixable over time. Yeah, you too. can you know, fix that you over can time. Train but, a new but why yes. start with something that you have a lot of issues with? Exactly. I, I agree with that, but um, definitely fixable over time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Ryan and I planted a tree this year, and um, I thought I had picked out the most awesome tree. And he comes up to the tree and he's like, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. I hate to be so negative. Just the placement of the limbs or what Um, was the main problem? Well, first of all, the tree was planted too deep in the pot. And he really had to excavate that pot uh, to find that first root. Sure. And so, but I think that's a common problem. Yeah. But then he showed me that some of the side branches had been clipped. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even notice it when I was purchasing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, what that told me is that there was a little bit of drought and death on some of those tips. It wasn't the central leader like Chris was talking Mm -hmm. about that kind of redirects growth. It was just a lot of the tips had a little pruning cut made and it wasn't a proper pruning cut. There's a little Mm -hmm. tiny stub there. So that's that's gonna be an issue. So that tells me that that plant was drought stressed and that the nursery snipped off some limbs that were maybe not looking good. Um, So that, 
Not to say that that isn't a plant I would purchase, but it's something that if I can look at a lot of them and I can find one that doesn't have a lot of those pruning cuts, I'd probably select one that doesn't have the pruning cuts. Just make sure you inspect um, it really well. Yeah, so I went through and just cleaned up each one of those little stubs. Mm -hmm. um, your it, tree's going to be fine, okay. but, it, I, but it's just a sign, <laughs> it's just a it's sign that good. it maybe was not in optimal health at one point. Um, and that could ultimately lead to the, the tree is doing great, by the way. Good. Good. Good, um, good to hear. Um, but you know stress is not good for trees so so a bigger issue to me though was what you pointed out with it being too deep in the oh, pot yeah. and the reason being we want to plant it at the right depth we want to find that first root uh or roots actually find the root flare of the trunk where that root uh root collar starts or root, root flare is and plant at that level at the soil surface so if you had planted it at the at the level of the pot you know our tree would have been you know four four to six inches probably too deep uh, so you do need to, anytime you plant a tree, kind of excavate down into that pot or the ball and burlap and find that root flare and plant at that yeah. depth. Yeah, and I think yeah. we have a photo of one that I had seen where they didn't even take the pot off. It was planted <laughs> yeah. in the ground with the pot still on it, which was an interesting You uh, know, I've had that question concept. before in my <laughs> horticulture <laughs> career where they're like, do I take the pot off? And I'm like... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Or I love the I love the old line that burlap is biodegradable and it just you just leave mm -hmm. it on and plant mm -hmm. the tree. Well, yeah, that's another. Uh, there's some great. I don't have a personal picture. There's some great pictures on the internet of oh, you know a, a bald and burlap tree that the burlap wasn't removed from and they've you know looked at it when the tree died and yeah. you have tiny tiny roots coming out of you know a trunk this big. There's tiny tiny roots coming out of where that root ball used to be. Uh, burlap does decompose over time. That's true. But it's a restrictive of enough layer to root growth that you don't want to leave in place. If really, it's natural burlap too. It's not, sometimes well, they yeah, use sometimes a plastic. Like, yeah. um, so really, <laughs> in, the goal in tree planting is to loosen that soil around the root ball, so those those roots have nice loose soil to you know grow out into. So to me, that burlap is just a huge impediment to root growth out into the nice loose soil that you've prepared all around your planted tree. So. Uh, so yeah, that's a big no-no. That's true. Um, that is true. Now, how about um, staking? I know that we've got a couple pictures where someone have had stakes or guidelines on a on a tree, which you typically might do in that first year. Uh, but then, what happens if you don't take those off? What's that, a Chris? I I got a photo of that. Got, yeah. I yeah. put a couple yeah. in too because the one that I have it's an oak tree, and they had staked it for years and years and years. And the tree, it's it's like it's big, uh, so the but they just left the stakes on for way too long. And when they took them off eventually after the years, it just plopped over into the alleyway right next to it. And wow. they were just, the, that's when they called the extension office, like, well, what do we do? Our tree has no structure. It's falling over. So I was like, well, that's that's a tough one because the tree was almost as tall as their house. Oh my wow. goodness. And it was a two-story house. Wow. Um, I, yeah, it, it, that would be a really hard fix. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. and you... the ones I saw, I, they were in a, uh, parking lot, mm -hmm. and they had just never taken the taken the stakes yeah. off. So the rings that were around the trunk had just grew right into the bark because they just never took them off. Well, so why it's important? Like, what 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 should you do with staking then? Um, the answer, the way I answer that question is, you only stake when it's absolutely necessary to keep that tree upright. So if you have yeah. a tree that's really tall that you've planted relative to the size of the root ball, there's maybe enough leverage mm -hmm. it could be blown over. So that's when you attach a loosely attached stake that's you know it's not a super tight line pulling it but it's tight enough that if that tree starts to want to fall over you know your staking material can stop it um, why we don't want to have a tree that's fully staked like that for 20 years mm -hmm. or however long is um, trees need exposure to wind and the environment to develop a strong trunk to develop a strong root system that counteracts those forces so if we provide artificially that support for a tree when we remove it, it it's over. not going to have a, a structurally stable trunk a root system that supports that so yeah. um, you know staking is something that I rarely do um, only when it's that that rare tree that I think is going to topple over if I don't or there's times where I think it is actually a really good uh, protection for the tree in a park setting or someplace mm -hmm. like that where you can you may have like a high potential for mower damage or people bumping into it. It's like a physical barrier almost that keeps a mower yeah, away from a trunk. Keeps the mowers away. Yeah. I, I also will do just leave the stakes up, and not even have it, have it tied to anything, and I'll put fencing around for deer. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, yeah there you that's go. That's usually why I'm using it. It's a good mm -hmm. way to yeah. use it. And then if you do stake, you remove it within a year. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Your yeah, tree you should be able to overcome that. that balance issue in a year. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if, it, if it's not, then there's probably bigger issues than a stake will fix. Mm -hmm. If it's not getting root development down there, yeah. there's a much bigger issue. But awesome. mo like Chris, have you had to stake a lot of trees in your profession as a landscaper? Not typically, but what I've found is that when we do bald and burlap trees, that's dug right out of the field. So it's soil, it's yeah. heavy. You don't have to stake those. And we did a lot sure. of bald and burlap trees. When we switch to containerized trees, which is a soilless mix, it's very lightweight, and we have to do a lot of root pruning because containers have circling roots, yeah. and so we prune that off. So there's it's there's not much weight down there. So it's that time usually when we have to do put like like Ryan described, we put one stake on the ground, usually on the prevailing wind side of the tree, loosely tie like a canvas, you know, a strip mm -hmm. around so that the tree can still move, and then just we leave that on for about a year and. Yeah, hopefully the mowers yeah. stay away also. Well, that's that's definitely the case that is a, a good staking tree, or st a tree that needs staking. is just yeah. a tall container plant. Because mm -hmm. like you said, there's just not much weight down there. Um, if you do stake, that attachment material is kind of important. That, Like Chris mentioned, mm -hmm. you kind of want something flat and thin to go against the bark. You don't want something really skinny and restricted. Mm -hmm. A know, wire that, that's going to dig in. A wire would be the yeah. worst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's different materials. Kind of, kind of like the webbing that you have for a seatbelt kind of material. It's much thinner, a little more. Sure. Not yeah. as thick, but um, that's really the ideal stuff is that kind of webbing type material is what I always use for, yeah. for a stake support. Yeah. Good pointers. Keep those questions or uh, sharing of your landscape fails coming. Lauren had a, a comment here. She said her biggest fail is poor planning. Um, she buys one plant at a time, planted in the wrong spot. So I have a very weird hodgepodge of plants. She said, I love them all. But they just don't look good together. And she's making slow progress and moving and duplicating some. Um, she just can't help herself when it comes to buying new plants. Yeah. We're with you, Lauren. That up. is my yeah. garden as well. Yeah. Or, or Thank you for <laughs> keeping us in business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think all of us are plant addicts. So I think well, a lot of times I'll buy, I'll go to the garden center, see something new that I haven't tried before. And, you know, you got to like, try it. You got to get it. But you're not going to buy three of it, right? You're not going to do a mass planting like you would a lot of times in a normal landscape so don't feel bad about it we do it too happens to the best it of happens. us i think i think a good self-imposed rule to implement is don't buy a plant you don't have a place for and i wish i could abide by that True. i tried to but do as we say um, not as just we like do. candace said you see that really cool thing and it's like oh i'll find a place for this but that's been my biggest issue, I think, are those plants I took home before I had a place for, and they kind of sat around till I plonked them somewhere uh -huh. out of yeah. desperation. Yeah. But. but you also had a good point, you know, uh, you know, if you have one liatris here, one daylily here, if you added repetition, whether you add, you know, a couple more liatrises in yeah. that garden the same or color. group them together, it might make it a little bit more cohesive. Um, I was inspired by a particular plant, a uh, wild onion this year, and it has this really delicate pale pink flower, and I hodged podged it all throughout the garden. And so I was like, oh, it was kind of my inspiration for color and design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I kind of wanted, since it has that pale flower, I kind of wanted some like dark purples and maybe oranges to kind of highlight that flower. So I think that one flower is kind of inspiring me to make the garden a little more cohesive. Yeah. You can use ground nice. cover to do just that, or yeah. even just some mass plantings in the background to help. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then use your plants that you bought that maybe they're on sale, which the is what stuff. I usually do, the fun stuff. Those are <laughs> accent plants. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You just buy three, five. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there's something that I kind of enjoy about that ever evolving landscape yes. project. That's me that turns too. Out yeah. I like, yeah. I'm always moving stuff, oh, yeah. dividing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Or wanting to, uh, I go shopping with Candace a lot, and she always buys more plants than me, but <laughs> she'll be like, oh, I've been wanting to try that plant. And <laughs> you, you don't know, know until you she try doesn't, it. She probably has no clue where she's going to plant no, it. No, I don't. I'll figure it out. Um, I've got a friend that's a landscape architect, and what he says is just think of it as a temporary storage spot. If you don't like this shrub or this exactly. tree, hey, you can dig it up next year and move, move it, it over there. That's, that's what he's done. With that. So do that. that's another way is just, you know, it's, at least get it in the ground so it can be happy for a little while. You can move yeah. it later. Exactly. And the best time to transplant for if they if she does want some suggestions i like to do it in the fall is my favorite time because then you're past that hot dry summer um you can get them in the ground get them water get some roots started and then they can kind of have that winter to to go dormant mm -hmm. you can do it yeah. spring you can do it summer 
but you just have to make sure you're watering to throughout yeah, the season. Yeah, it's just a watering issue. Yeah. Fall is so, probably the easiest with yeah. respect to watering. Yeah, but I do a lot in the spring, too, just because mm -hmm. the plants are small. They're just coming up. You can do now, if it's truly too. transplanting, like digging it, like I was talking about, digging up that plant and moving sure. it, then you really have to wait till wintertime till it's dormant. So that may dictate what your timing on when you're transplanting. Mm -hmm. is wintertime is going to be best because it's going to have the least stress on that plant. Sure. And, and she's talking about sure. perennials, I herbaceous. Oh. He's talking about, He's talking about woody plants. plants. Shrubs and trees, <laughs> perennials. Different plants. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Great. We love your fail. We're, we're on the same page, Lauren. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, called being a gardener. Exactly. Being a plant <laughs> lover. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. So if you have other gardening questions or landscape fails you want to share, add them to the comments. But I think we've got some more of our own that we can talk about. So um, one of the other things we were talk touching on before the show was a little bit about hardscaping and some fails maybe with hardscaping. So I put in a picture of uh, my previous garden, of the first house I bought. About two weeks after I moved in, we had a big windstorm come through. And I had probably a 50-foot maple in the backyard that just came right out of the ground. Oh, just fell right over. And of course, it landed on the power line and the Aww. deck, and the, you know, it did all of that stuff. Um, but what I was left with was a ring of landscape brick that was planted around mm -hmm. this uh, this tree. And as we talked about with most volcanoes, when you bury the trunk of the tree, the whether that's with soil, with mulch, whatever, whatever, whatever it might be, you're going to cause rotting, and that's. All that's what had happened. The previous owner had had surrounded that the bottom of that tree with soil, caused it to rot, and when a strong enough windstorm came through, it just fell right out of the ground. And the bricks didn't help. The bricks did not. And that and, was the downfall. And rock would not have helped no, either. No, nothing no. would have helped except for exposing the root flare of that of that tree and not planting it so I'm deep. I'm super interested. I've been seeing a lot on the internet about like tree surgery like excavating that root flare to try to get it to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know to try to you know it's, it's kind of hard to like pull a tree up and plant it correctly but to excavate that but doesn't it I admit for you guys is sorry doesn't it leave like a depression. A depression. Yeah, you don't want to build a swimming pool for the tree. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't work out quite yeah. well. Yeah. But there, there's t I often say if the tree's too deep and there's not really any way to excavate the soil without creating a nice, nice basin around it. I, I tell the homeowner, enjoy this tree. It's not gonna last forever. Have a certified arborist come out every year to evaluate it, make sure it's still sound, and then buy another tree and plant it nearby for mm -hmm. when this one is eventually gonna have to come down. Yeah, yeah. I think there's kind of a, a, uh, a balance though. I, as an arborist, I did a ton of root collar excavations mm -hmm. every year. Um, and so there are those trees where you're going to create a Foot, you know yeah. a giant bowl shape of a thing if you start to excavate yeah. but a lot of them it may not take that much you may just have a bowl you know you may be going down four or six inches and you do create this little area that's somewhat of just a maintenance issue mm -hmm. so i mean mm -hmm. that's that's kind of the determination that a, an arborist can help you make is do i have this tree that is going to require so much excavation it is this swampy bowl i'm creating or is there this manageable level you can reach where, where you can um, expose that trunk flare and by excavating a little bit and have a healthy tree? And I've just, it, it took me a long time of see, it took me several years of seeing some of those root collar excavations that I then went back to and found a healthy tree after, you know, a couple nice. years later to really understand how important that trunk flare is. I mean, it just, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal where you, you plant that, but that depth is just absolutely critical. And especially in cases where that tree is in maybe a little bit of compacted soil or some other soil issue yeah. exists, then you add in that extra stress of being planted a little bit deep and it just, it turns into a, you know, really unhealthy tree. Um, so, you know, I understand it's super important. It, it can be deceiving it. too though, because the, the homeowners, you know, they see a tree that's lived 10, 15 years and they think, well, now all of a sudden it's something has happened. It's sick. Yeah. Or it was a sudden change. It's a sudden yeah. change that happened. Yeah. Exactly. But if you think about the lifespan of what a tree should be over a hundred years in many cases, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years is not that long. Not good. Well, yeah. well, and unfortunately in a lot of those root collar excavations, I would find a girdling root. Mm -hmm. So that's because the 
you know, root, roots grew around the trunk for a number of different reasons. Either it was containerized and they were circling. Yeah. Uh, but when you have soil up there, then that root can develop into an area where there's trunk tissue it can press against. If roots cross, that's no problem. They, the root tissues fuse, but when roots cross a trunk, then it strangles the trunk. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I would do that root collar excavation and find a super big girdling root around three quarters of the trunk. And it's, that was the advice was just, you know, enjoy your tree for the next five years. It's going to slowly decline. Yeah. Um, don't let it become a safety issue before you cut it down, you know. Uh, so sometimes that's just the best mm -hmm. advice you yeah. can give. Yes. Maples are highly notorious for that girdling root. Too, yeah. Right? yeah. Especially yeah. the newer hybrids. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm certainly. noticing a theme here. Ryan and Chris really don't like it when you plant your trees too deep. <laughs> so next time you buy don't a tree, make it. sure you watch some credited YouTube video or do some research before you just go out there and dig that hole and plant that tree. Now, I have a question for you, Chris. What's the face that you make when you see a tree that is planted too deep? Can you replicate that for us? I replicate that. Okay. It's, uh, Reaction. It, it depends on the tree. If it's a Norway maple, it's like, mm, yeah, fine. If it is a nice, <laughs> if it's like a bird. You deserve oak, to die. Like, you should be. You're in the state of where you are because of who you are. Um, but if it's like a bur oak, uh, or, you know, I also really love like sweet gums and, and those types of trees. It's more like a <gasps> kind of face. So, you know, it's a shocked, horrified call the officials, whoever that person would be. Um, call you. I, I guess call me. <laughs> call the extension of it. Call the police, they don't do anything. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's just, it depends on the species because I, I see so many maples that are planted too deep and we overplant maples anyway. Yeah, Let's you're be like, honest, eh. they're beautiful trees, but yeah. they're overplanted. And uh, I, if I see a, a pretty, like a nice tree, a good oak, sweet gum, Inca. Hey, it's Inca. great to be in the Inca. company of a fellow sweet gum lover. Oh, I, as yeah. an arborist, I've had to defend sweet gums for my whole career because They're of so their messy. their fruits. Yes, oh, I love but them. But I've always loved them. Crazy. You know, for their for their fall color, their unique leaf mm -hmm. shape. Um, they they're color, a great urban tree. They color up weird. Like they start <laughs> off as like little spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is an unusual before mm -hmm. unusual they. Color um, but I love the fruit too. Oh, the fruit is beautiful. It, it's so architecturally mm -hmm. that On structure. The yeah. It's like an alien has come to our planet and has <laughs> landed their little pods on our tree, and then they fall down and they hurt our feet when we walk on them barefoot. But they, there's little seeds within those balls that birds eat. So it is mm -hmm. a source of food for wildlife. Valuable. Um, can, can we use them in arrangements at all? Can we? Are they useful? People do. They're spray tacky paint them, spray in paint arrangements. Them. Oh. Some people spray paint them gold, make wreaths out of them. Yeah. I'm not condoning yeah. it. I'm just saying. Just people well, do that. I throw them in bonfires, and the only thing left after everything's burned away are those sweet gum balls. Yeah, yeah, really? Cool. Oh, yeah, they, huh? they stay. Yeah, they hang ah. out. But mm -hmm. once the fall color comes up i love the kind of technicolor different colors of sweet gums yeah. oh yeah all the colors on yeah things. like purple yeah. yellow red everything yeah. it decided that it yeah. was going to be everything it's a good kid tree too my kids call it the star tree because oh yeah the leaves are easy to the, recognize the star. Yeah. yeah so they really like that one yeah mm. it's a star tree that drops the slingshot ammunition the slingshot. Oh, that's a new word Make for those. Fun. Slingshot ammunition. That would get hurt to hit with the hit with Yeah, a stick. Cool. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. So, um, do you guys want to talk about tree spades? Because we are sitting here. In the, Somebody we're stole a tree. We're sitting here on campus, and there's a, a truck outside our window who's been digging up some trees while we're talking today. <laughs> Do you guys want to comment on uh, tree spades, maybe in best practices? I, I don't have too much to say other than it, it's something that clients that I've worked with or even in my own yard, I would not be able to afford that service because it's very expensive because the reason they're using the spade is because they're moving big trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with what a tree spade is, you've probably seen them on the road. There's a big truck with a big cone-shaped spade on the back <laughs> of, the, of the truck they uh, back up to the tree open up that spade and then dig up dig up that tree basically and then just bring it back on the truck yeah they have huge uh, it's big plates that are driven by hydraulics that take you know take that tree out of the ground yeah. um very costly and um in my opinion a very risky transplant you know because if you think about the amount of root system we're taking compared to the above ground growth it has to support it's a tiny tiny fraction uh, so not my preferred method, but in the case where you want a huge, large tree 
tomorrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the only way you can get that. So in my case, I favor smaller plants that I can kind of nurse along. I, mm -hmm. Like to me, the smaller I can plant a plant, the better of a plant I can prune to be what I want and, and do other things to take care of. So um, that's just the biggest thing with, with tree spading. I think a lot of folks, especially when you build a new home, uh, think that's the best way they can establish their landscape. Well, if you've got, if you can wait a little bit, you'll probably have better plants in the long run, in my opinion, with planting stuff that's containerized or bald and burlapped, which yeah. probably my favorite out of all those types of planting mediums mm -hmm. are the containerized plants. I've just had the best luck. I'm right the there with, with you, plants. Ryan. I yeah. find that I'd rather plant a four inch perennial than a one gallon perennial. I'd rather plant a containerized tree than a ball and burlap tree because I just feel like it's easier to take care of them in the long run. Plus, okay, so I've been on this uh, carbon sink thing lately. So um, you plant a smaller tree, then you're going to be sequestering more carbon in the long run. So if you planted a young oak containerized, then you're going to, you know, do more good for the environment than maybe planting, uh, you know, what's the thing called again? Tree, tree spading. Space. Then tree splating, splating, spading. <laughs> tree spading an oak. So, huh. wait, doesn't research show though that smaller trees establish faster than the larger trees and they can actually catch up in some cases? Mm -hmm. And I sense. feel that way with perennials. I feel yeah. like you plant a gallon perennial and a four inch perennial, and in one or two years, you can hardly tell yeah, which know. one it was. Yeah. I haven't tested it in a landscape setting. What mm -hmm. I would love to see is containered plant versus bald and burlap yeah. plant 10 yeah. years from now, but yeah, I've yeah. seen a lot of. Um, natural restorations, you know, forest restoration project projects where I could look at the same years of trees that were started from bare root seedlings versus container plants. Those are probably the two different sizes you can sure. use. And I could show you a, a ton of, you know, replanted forests that are the same size in 10 years from those two different size of plants. And uh, the reason why that was uh, something landowners should consider is those bare root seedlings are a lot cheaper to establish than container plants. You know, you're spending more on plant material, which I think that translates all the way up through all the plant material we can use. You're gonna pay more for a larger piece of plant material that is at, at more risk of not making it than a smaller. Mm -hmm. The smaller is gonna be cheaper mm -hmm. and you're gonna have a better success rate over the long run. So yeah. those are kind Absolutely of the things to weigh when you're selecting. Yep. And I'm assuming they're doing some construction here, which is why they're moving all of all of these trees, but it's I, fun to watch. While we're I absolutely here. agree with that <laughs> statement. The smaller kind of is easier in the long run. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Are uh, we? We yeah, don't get to I know. That was... We what? got a lot more fails to come. Yeah, there's a lot more fails we could talk about. <laughs> before, before, you, before we go, do not plant spireas next to barberries. Oh, we didn't get to catch. Yeah, if really I fail. see that one more time, I am going to scream. Yeah. I don't um, like that combination. Also, before we go, do we want to talk about our next show? Kelly's advice. Yes. Yeah, so we have up. one more show for the year on December 4th. You can hop on back on, and uh, we'll answer any of those gardening questions as usual. And I think we're going to do some evergreen holiday stuff, too, mm -hmm. some fun stuff for the holidays and the winter season. So join us again on December 4th at noon, our typical time. Uh, we want to thank you guys for joining us, and we want to thank Chris, our Thanks guest. Thank, thank you, Chris. Chris. We appreciate it. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Get out there and garden.